Hello Internet, it's me, Aaron, and I'm going to answer your questions. So without further ado, here's part one of Aaron Answers. Largo64 asks, What is your take on morality, and whether the Bible is the sum of all morality? In other words, can atheists be moral if they don't follow the Bible? Well, first things first, Largo, I'd like to thank you for lobbing me that softball so I can knock it out of the park. It doesn't make sense that we would evolve any other way. Uh, we're a social animal. We hunt in packs, as it were. You know, we became agricultural and we learned to live together. Clearly, groups of people who work well together, who play well with others, are going to do better than the ones who are always fighting each other. The ones who fight each other end up usually just killing each other off and <laughs> they're not going to pass their genes on. So, you know, the human race has evolved to get along to a certain extent. We still have outliers and we still have our own primal nature that we have to overcome. You notice that whenever there's a very, very uh, horrific act of violence towards even one person, an individual, but especially towards large groups of people, it's usually based on race or religion or some other way to classify them as others. The reason we demonize our enemies is because we can convince ourselves and others that they're not human, that they're somehow less than human, subhuman, then it's okay. It's okay to kill them. It's okay to wipe them out. Notice that we have to convince ourselves first, in most cases, that they're not human. Even, you know, psychotic uh, killers usually think, well, I wasn't killing people, they were demons. Uh, great uh, movie, what was it called? Frailty. Pick up Frailty sometime if you want to check that out. That's pretty interesting stuff there. Um, so, yeah, uh, we tend to empathize more powerfully, more... Um, clearly with other human beings. We empathize with animals as well, especially ones that are obviously emotive. Uh, survival of the cutest, as I always say. But uh, if something is capable of expressing emotion, we empathize with it. Especially if it's another human being, we tend to empathize very naturally. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon. In fact, experiments have been conducted to show that empathy exists within other primates and even other mammals that aren't primates, like rats. I will uh, give the information for a couple of studies done with empathy in rats. Uh, and I might go into this in, in another video because it's a fascinating topic. Empathy is a naturally occurring phenomenon. It is not exclusive to the human race. And it explains morality. Now, uh, as Pino talks about the storyteller in our mind that makes us perceive that we have free will and uh, we're somehow uh, rationalizing our decisions with uh, uh, subconscious uh, decisions are being rationalized with a kind of uh, a creative center of our brain. In much the same way, we elaborate upon our basic instinct to be kind and compassionate uh, to help others with glorious, you know, very uh, delusions of grandeur. It's not perhaps the best way to put it, but we tend to very much glorify compassion. And I think it should be glorified because it's a very nice thing. So whether or not it comes from our instinct or genetics or whatnot. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. What's important is that we have it. One thing we do know is that it didn't come from the Bible because if the Bible had to be around for us to be moral, we would have all killed each other a long time before the Bible came out. Hey, hey, the holy fucking Bible, son. It was only printed a while ago. <laughs> Run a search for Nice Guys Finish First. It's a great documentary by none other than Richard Dawkins himself about the uh, nature of morality and uh, we're uh, are working together. I personally would think that it would come from a, a evolutionary psychology. I also recommend an introduction to evolutionary psychology. Great book, it's very brief, it's illustrated, it's very funny and witty and it's very light reading. It's a good introduction, it's not very technical at all, it just gives you the basic overview of the study of evolutionary psychology. I will link to the Amazon <laughs> Uh, page for it in the in the notes over there. So, great question, Largo. Thank you very much. 
Mortis Dominus asks, what are your views on brain theory and the ekpyrotic universe theory? Well, as I briefly touched upon brain theory in Evolution, the Big Bang, and Star Trek, uh, I am a fan of string theory, uh, which, of which brain theory is a part of. Uh, string theory, for those of you who don't know, is a way of looking at our universe uh, that solves the problem to an extent, and we'll get to that later, of unification. So, uh, explaining energy and matter, explaining um, gravitation and quantum mechanics. Um, combining these, these two, the very large and the very small, the, the fields of physics that don't seem to get along, uh, string theory is a way to kind of unify everything. Now, I'm personally fascinated by it, and I know that it's kind of, it, it waxes and wanes, like every few years something happens, Ed Witten will come up with a, a great new theory, and everyone will get excited about it, then a couple of years later, oh, well, the string theory is old, man, it's old news, then a couple of years later, it's big again. Um, so, you know, I don't really pay attention to what's popular. I just pay attention to what makes sense to me. And string theory makes a lot of sense. And now, that being said, you asked about brain theory specifically. Brain theory is an extension of string theory, which uh, theorizes that our universe as we know it is a three-dimensional slice. Bear with me here. Imagine that this piece of paper is our universe. Now, we think of our universe as the wholeness of all dimensional space. But if you were living on a two-dimensional plane, like this piece of paper, you could go up and down, and left and right, but you couldn't go back and forth. Imagine, then, that our three-dimensional universe is much like this two-dimensional sheet of paper. We see and perceive three dimensions, up, down, left, right, and back and forth. But what if there's another dimension we're not aware of? Another dimension of space. There could be another universe parallel to us, perhaps even a millimeter or less away from us, in four-dimensional space. Another three-dimensional universe. And there could be many, many, many of these. So you may have heard of the multiverse. This would be the uh, idea there are many parallel universes. Now, uh, brain theory is not the only way that we can conceive of multiple universes. There's a, a kind of a more literal translation of quantum mechanics where every possibility does occur, which is mind-boggling because that would imply that every time anything happens, it is a chance that anything else could happen. And I'm talking about not just, you know, you decide to eat a banana or an apple, but the tiny, 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 tiny exchanges that go on down the quantum level of which there are probably you know millions per, per any given second in any given square inch uh, then it generates a whole new universe for that possibility which would mean every second there are billions and billions of universes being generated it's pretty incredible to think about I like brain theory because it's a little more stable there are less universes to deal with but of course this is really not possible for us to know at least at the moment uh, but it is a very elegant solution so say that there are two brains uh, and they've been drifting closer and closer together for some time and then sometime uh, billions of years ago two membranes collapsed and what happened when they collapsed they retracted and started moving away from each other but then a shock wave was sent through our universe and that could be the explanation for the Big Bang. Now, of course, all of this really doesn't explain anything. It just kind of, it's a, it's a regress. It's a way of saying, okay, this is how our universe was created. But then how were the brains created initially? And, you know, it doesn't really answer as much as we would like it to. However, I do think it is a particularly functional model. I think that it, it makes sense, at least to my mind, it makes a lot of sense and uh, it could very well explain the Big Bang. Uh, so where we go from there is going to depend on whether we were able to observe outside of our observable universe or not, uh, which we're going to have to be around for a lot longer to ever be able to test that kind of stuff. So that's what I think of brain theory and that pyrotic universe. <clears throat> you should read your Bible, sirs. You'll find all types of weird shit in there. <laughs>